I'm Sarah Lynn Bowman. Um, I am a uh, scholar of LARP and Fulpine. Um And uh, I also am a, um, a teacher in uh, uh, mainly community college, but also university settings. Um, community college, for uh, those who don't know, in America, um, mm -hmm. uh, you can, uh, there, there's government funded community colleges that are uh, accessible for uh, people from diverse backgrounds um, uh, and tend to be cheaper than university settings. Um, and so I teach at Austin Community College, it's one of the jobs that I have, and I teach humanities, um, which is a really fun class. So since I've been doing a lot of research on EduLARP, I decided to, um, if we, I have to be in an on-ground classroom, then I might as well be LARPing, right? Um, at least some of the time. So what's the problem? Um, the problem is that students have varying degrees of interest in learning, <laughs> um, and, uh, motiv and they have varying degrees of motiv motivation for engagement. Um, uh, the theory and some research suggests that EduLARP is intrinsically motivating. In fact, uh, we did a study, a study uh, myself and my uh, collaborator, Ann Standifer, where we studied some middle school students who were in an EduLARP curriculum, and quantitative research suggested that they do find uh, EduLARP intrinsically motivating and helping with self-efficacy, which is something that uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, Ventura. However, <laughs> Not all students feel comfortable engaging in classroom activities, as we've been uh, hearing about today. Some prefer experiential learning and hands-on activities, um, and we're seeing more and more in that, of that as we have a very interactive society where people are getting more engaged with screens and, and used to, to interactivity. Um, but some actually just prefer lecture, and they like structure, and they like tests. They like to know how they're doing. Um, which is, is something that, um, as someone who's not that way, I have to keep in mind when I'm, um, when I'm teaching. So there has to be some sort of balance of that. Some would rather not attend at all. Some feel coerced to be there, even in college. Um, you know, some feel that they are never gonna get a job if they don't go to college, and that's the only reason they're there. Or maybe their parents are gonna kick them out of their house if they don't you know, go to class. Um, and while they're in the classroom, they feel coerced to do what I tell them to do because I'm a teacher. They want to get a good grade. And I try to be as you know, laid back about grades as possible um, because it's not ter terribly important to me. Um, but it, it, it is still important that they participate, right? So EduLARPs may not have high stakes in terms of grades, meaning that when you're in an EduLARP, generally you're not grading the students based on what they do in the LARP, I hope. Because um, uh, you know you want to give them permission to fail. That's one of the great things about EduLARP. Um, but they do have um, high stakes in terms of <coughs> classrooms. Do have high stakes, right? Just for the very the very act of being in a classroom and the power dynamics that are there. So an, inc an inconvenient truth: uh, the classroom feels like an inherently coercive environment for many students. Modern children are forced to go to school with few alternative options. Uh, in the US, their parents can be punished if they are truant, if they don't go to school. The increased emphasis on testing, which we just learned about, and metrics to measure human intellect and ability cause many students anxiety, depression, or angst. We have you know, eight-year-olds that are having to be treated for anxiety disorder because of the testing that they have to undergo. Uh, it's, it's become very, very problematic. And some students have disabilities that make it difficult for them to engage in the same way as others, um, whether those are learning disabilities or otherwise. And th that can cause alienation or low self-esteem. And we do know that EduLARP does tend to help uh, these types of students. Um, not always, though. Some of those students really need structure, and EduLARP can be a very chaotic environment, and it can destabilize their structure that they've uh, grown accustomed to. But for the most part, we know that um, at places like Osterskov, after school, in Denmark, um, they do see some good results of people, for, for example, uh, who are on the autism spectrum. Um, so I teach this Humanities 1301 class, which is prehistory to Renaissance, which is like a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> like, no pressure, you know, just everything that's happened. Um, uh, and um, it's, a, it's a freshman level class, um, so it's sort of like an introduction to 
college in a lot of ways, as much as it's an introduction to your humanities. Um, so community college settings uh, have diverse populations. There are high schoolers that are getting um, dual credit. There are retired soldiers in my classroom. Uh, that's an interesting dynamic, by the way. Uh, there are international students, uh, a lot of international students. Um, and there are full-time mothers. And there are international students that if, if they fail my class, they get deported. And th that's, that's a different kind of ex uh, experience. Uh, seriously. Um, there, that's a different kind of experience as somebody who, you know, is just trying to get dual credit so they can get, uh, you know, uh, out, of high or out of college quicker. There are full-time mothers. I had a student that had uh, four children uh, last time. Uh, and so, you know, definitely scheduling issues that go on with that. Um, etc. So that means we have low retention rates. Um, you know, less than half usually stay throughout the semester. Um, less than 32% will likely transfer. This is my school that I'm talking about. Less than 32% will likely transfer to a four-year college. So these community colleges are the first two years of their curriculum, and then they're supposed to transfer. That's the idea, right? Less than 32% actually do that, and less than 6% will obtain a degree. Meanwhile, student debts are rising. So people are acquiring debt to go to college so that they get, get the job and then they're not finishing college. So there's a real issue with this problem, um, keeping people in the classroom and then creating activities that make them excited to learn, right? And so of course, yeah, edulearp, but what if edulearp is inherently stressful as well? Um, we'll get to that in a second. Sir, should you say something about how young are the youngest students you have? Probably 15, 16. Yeah. But they're in a college classroom, so they're expected to behave like adults. Mm -hmm. how, how old are you when you usually start college? Uh, 18. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I have uh, people that you know, are in their 50s or 60s that have never got to go to college, and so they're coming in. So it's an intergenerational classroom as well, which actually is quite nice. So, uh, so this is a freshman community college survey course uh, that, that covers lot, large swaths of history, art, technological developments, literature, etc. So it's like, today we're going to do a thousand years of China. <laughs> uh, very difficult to, to, to try to figure out how to, how to manage that level of, of information. So my strategy is actually to let the book handle that, and then when they're in the classroom, they're doing a lot of group work activities. Um, I don't do a lot of lecturing uh, to reinforce the material, which actually works well if you're transitioning to edulart, because then you're just adding a little bit of a framework on top of the group work that they're already doing. So it's a massive, a massive amount of content. <laughs> we have an excellent textbook, uh, Gloria Fierro's The Humanistic Tradition, Volume 1. And then for the second course that they can take, it's um, Renaissance to Current Day, which is also incredible. But it, it's a large textbook. It's a lot of reading, and it's a lot of content. Um, uh, and so I don't expect them to know all of that stuff. I don't even know all of that stuff. Um, so my focus is on covering as much information as possible so um, when I do edulearp, it's subject matter revision rather than exposure to new ideas. And this is one of sort of the, the in the in the survey that I did, the, the lit review that I did, this is sort of one of the arguments in edulearp is whether or not you should expose people to new material while they're in the game. Are, is that a good way to learn things? And um, one of my colleagues, Mikhail Mocharki, uh, he believes that um, it's better as revision rather than exposure to new ideas. And, and so I kind of took that idea uh, you know, they've already read the book. Now can we kind of, you know, go over it together? Go over some of the content. And in some ways, I let them self-select what content they want to talk about. You know, get into groups and, and discuss, you know, uh, five things the Greeks were good, were good at in terms of art. Go. And so then they get to choose what, what, what elements of the book that they really want to discuss. So edulearps also focus on presentation skills and their ability to pitch ideas or persuade other students. So my, my, my classes are less uh, fun than other edulearps probably because they are in kind of high stakes situations where they have to like uh, convince people to uh, uh, give them money uh, or convince people to give them a job um, or convince people to um, join their religion. Uh, but I do believe that edulearp can train multiple skills at once and I'm trying to give them some um, exposure to being in front of people and having to explain themselves. And sometimes the, the group that wins is not necessarily the, the group that had the best idea, but the group that pitched it the best. And that's something that I can demonstrate. Um, and it, it, you know, I'm hoping that that will help them in interviews and other kind of practical situations that they come into. 
not all of them will probably write a you know try to write a grant uh, proposal but some of them will be in situations where they have to present information uh, either to their boss or whatever whatever their context so less fun probably a, a little stressful but um, So any edulark with any kind of performative element is potentially anxiety producing. And we talked about this earlier in terms of who's speaking, right? Who's going to present the information? Um, so I focus on low role uh, rather than heavy characterization, unlike my character that I wrote earlier um, for the earlier exercise. Um, I want to avoid students feeling uh, excessive performance anxiety about, oh, did I remember all the components of this character? Um, so uh, it's more low role and high goal. Um, in some cases, they, they don't, they, most of the time, they don't even have a name. They just have a, a, a group identity that their group is trying to do. I let, sometimes, sometimes I'll let them come up with a name if they want. Um, however, there, there's usually four or five people that have a, a, a more distinct role. Uh, and then there's uh, the rest of the class are in groups that are trying to convince these people of things. Um, so those people can have more characterization, uh, as little or, or as much as they want. So again, I generally emphasize small groups that come up with information that they remember from their book to try to convince a panel of judges to either fund a project, to give them a job, or back their religion, as I discussed. I, run, I have five of these a semester for this particular class. I haven't developed any for the other classes I teach. Um, only a few characters are given more complex roles, et cetera, and those people tend to have greater responsibility. So this is important. Um, some people have more responsibility in the classroom than others um, in, in the edular. Uh And so I basically, so for example, uh, members of the Empire's Council will decide on funding, um, or the leaders of various religious factions during the Protestant Reformation are trying to convince people to join their religion. Um, so those people um, volunteer. So, the, so I allow them to say, hey, who wants to uh, be a religious leader today? And, Usually, about the right number will raise their hands, which is about four. Um, not always, and sometimes I have to kind of, okay, I need one more person. Um, but generally, those are going to be your extroverts. Um, and unfortunately, uh, in American society, extroverts tend to get more attention in general. So yes, that means there's more spotlight, again, being put on them. However, they are opting into that, right? And somebody who, is, who doesn't feel comfortable with that um, may decide to opt into that role to challenge themselves. But I'm not saying you, you have to be this person, which is co even more coercive than having to do the exercise to begin with. Um, so yeah. So the downside is that they earn more spotlight, but it means that the eager students are the ones with the most responsibility of deploying the game, uh, so that it won't fall apart, hopefully. However, that might motivate other students to play more challenging roles in future exercises. So sometimes I might say in, in later ones, okay, who hasn't gone before that would like to go? Who hasn't gotten to be part of the council? So the rest of the students have small groups in which they make their initial plans and strategies, um, again, based on the revision of the material. Uh, I kind of went over this a little bit. Um, when all the plans are made, that's about 30 minutes, I only have an hour and 20 minutes to do these things, um, all the groups present in front of the whole class. And this is th this goal of having a revision, it helps ev everybody else remember what was in the chapter. And for those of them who haven't read the chapter, which on, unfortunately is quite a few, it gives them free exposure to the new material. But at least they're getting exposed to it in some way. So I may have somebody who's the secretary. So some people don't feel comfortable speaking, but they'll totally write a bunch of notes. Um, and so that gives them another role that they can, they can participate in. Um, one person usually is the person who presents the bulk of the group work. This is what we came up with. But I try to have at least uh, every person contribute one thing so that um, they, first of all, it's their participation grade, right? So everybody gets a grade to, to be part of it. But also, that way one person dominating the conversation doesn't necessarily take all the ideas and the credit what the group came up with. So that gives them a little bit of an out. If they're not comfortable speaking in front of the group, they can let somebody else do that. And these groups are generally, you know, three to six people, uh, groups of three to six. Sometimes they're pairs, though. So you do get that issue with neither person in the pair wants to speak. Um, so thus, these exercises are scalable from high responsibility and performativity to low although everyone is asked to contribute. 
So the edulart must be roughly as educational as a normal class period, um, meaning that I can't be wasting that day that I have to talk about China in the thousand years of China, which, you know, it goes fast, right? Um, it, with, with focusing on one little tiny thing, I mean, I really do have to cover a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, a lot of the group work that I do is, is, is similar to this anyway. This is just adding another, an element of fiction and com competition to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, so it's kind of like group work plus is the way I think about it. Uh, the role adds extra context and motivation. Um, so if I personally care whether my project is getting funded, that's different than the teacher asked me to regurgitate a bunch of facts. It's a different, different level of, of engagement. All of the LARPs are competitive, uh, except for one where they are uh, priests of uh, different religions and philosophies and they're just explaining their different perspectives. Um, this motivates some students bec uh, because a lot of students, uh, are, they're already in a competitive atmosphere. Um, they're, they're, they're both cooperating and competing because they're in, in groups, right? Uh, cooperating with each other, they're competing with other groups. So it adds a playful communal element to the classroom while retaining the achievement focus that's already present. So um, yes, unfortunately, people are competing for grades in class, um, but it also, that you can use that as a bonus. It's like, okay, well, we're already competing, let's do it in this fun way. <coughs> Perfection. No educational environment is perfect. Um, one of the kind of running jokes in pedagogy is that you know everybody thinks that they've got the new solution that's going to fix everything. Well, I'm sorry, that, that doesn't exist. People are all very complex. There's lots of different kinds of students that have different needs. Different classrooms have different dynamics, um, and some sometimes these exercises go better than others. Some strategies work better for certain students. Um, like again, some people like more structure. And some still prefer a traditional lecture format. But students often mention the edularps as the most interesting part of class in their class evaluations, which I think is a good indication that it's at least working for some of them. So the takeaways from this, um, maybe give students a way to scale their participation in the design while still including everyone. <coughs> so everybody gets to do something, but some people may have more responsibility than others. Allow students to volunteer for high responsibility roles rather than coercing them to play them. Um, and compliment students on good ideas or performances to encourage more participation. Lower the stakes for failure. Um, again, my, my exercises are kind of um, things that I find stressful, so um, I don't know if it's, it, it's kind of a, in some ways more high stakes than a lot of the other edulabs we've heard about today. Uh, but it's still, lowering the stakes of failure for failure than a normal classroom exercise that you're getting a grade on. So the ultimate goal is to encourage curiosity about the world. This is my ultimate goal of my class. Encourage curiosity about the world and a sense of global citizenship in these students while creating opportunities to succeed in school. So I don't, it doesn't actually matter to me how much of this they remember. What matters to me is that they become exposed to new ideas. You know, we have entire chapters on Islam. We have entire chapters on Hinduism. You know, these are things that they may not have been exposed to otherwise. And so we want them to be better global citizens walking out and hopefully be interested in taking other classes in the humanities. All right, so this is a very short uh, bibliography for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but these are the, the things that I was drawing from. Thank you.